going. In big days, you want players to stand up, and Ashin was one of those players. He'd tell you he'd score two, two goals and six points in a match, and he probably will. He's certainly a fantastic player, and especially when the pressure was on. Archie McConville, an ejection of pace. Back again from McGill McConville. What a goal! What a goal by McConville! He was outstanding, left and right footed, good fetcher, marvellous forward, would be on any team at any time. That's all he ever wanted to do, was play football. Oshin McConville in Armagh, an all-star, in Cross McGlen, a legend, in his mind, an addict. The square in Cross McGlen is the hub of everything that goes on, and uh, you know this, this is where you know I would have grown up and played a lot of football in the square before there was ca cars able to park even around here myself and the McIntyres and a few of the other boys you know who. You know, I would have grown up and played football with. You know, we all started off here and kicking the ball about and generally making a nuisance of ourselves. But uh, if you just look around the square, I mean, you see some of the some of the shops and that. Like just in, in our A line, there is Hertie's, McConville's, making teas, and that's only some of them. You go right around the town, and you know, there's, there's uh, they're the names that you would associate as suppose with with football and cross. You know, Gaelic football is really what this town is about, and. You know, anybody who's playing sport is, is involved in sport and they're involved, you know, up in that football field. And, you know, we have three pitches up there and, and there's not too many nights you would go up and where, where all three wouldn't be, wouldn't be used for some age group or another, right from under sixes, right up to senior level, like, you know. The core of a successful Cross McGlen team was beginning to form in the early 80s. Names like McEntee, McConville and Bellew were involved in a side which would become the greatest club team in the history of Gaelic football. Oshin McConville led that group and winning became a familiar habit. Leagues, championships and even All-Ireland success as a 12-year-old. The number 11 was beginning to blossom. He always played in, in a forward. Um, yeah, tried to, he was always one of the fellas that you could rely on to get scores. Um, never played any bad games. He always either good or very good. It was a very, very difficult time in Northern Ireland, a very difficult time in the club. You couldn't let youngsters go to a field without being with them. We were caught in attacks on, on, on the barracks. We were in the middle of the field. There was gunfire going on. We had to um, take cover in it. We, had, uh, there was, we were marched out of the field, I don't know, many times. Uh, I don't know what security forces thought we were training for something else other than football. It was nothing abnormal for us. Like it was, uh, it was just a done thing. Police soldiers, you know, on on foot patrol and, and helicopters and different things got there. It was something that uh, we were sort of oblivious to after a while. You know, <laughs> sometimes it actually worked to our advantage because if they did it during games, you'd see all the, you know, all the opposition going against here, and we might stick one in the net. You know what I mean? Because we were so used to it, we never. You know, we never really, uh, we never really looked around us. We didn't really pass that, sw that much remarks. People started to see us then, from I think from '96 as a, as a as a football outfit, not as you know. We were always recognised as being involved in the troubles and different things like that. I think Crossman then was then seen, you know, for something else, for sport and success. And then I think when we did that, I think we wanted to keep doing it. Joe Kernan come in and uh, a great organiser. Other team, red ball. That's it, Jim. Breakthrough. That's it, Anthony. Come on, we got the help. We got the help. You know, uh, good coach. You know, helped us immensely in that he wanted to take us where we wanted to go. It took us a couple of years, but eventually we got there. We won the championship. Went on to win All Ireland, and you know, it was basically, you know, this club has never known such success since.
that successful Cross McGlenn team was to form the backbone of a resurgent county side, also under new management. Two brands come in and I suppose they change it in, in many respects. There was a more professional attitude to it. We were training a lot more than we had done. We were training maybe three, four nights a week sometimes and it was tough training. We were an extremely fit team. The ball transferred inside to McCumber. It's a goal for us. Now the days of winning are over. Jarrett Burns, the Armagh captain from Silverbridge, holds the Anglo Celt couple up. Armagh are this year's Ulster champions. It's Armagh who will go on to this year's All Ireland series. From Ulster champions in '99 to All Ireland champions in 2002, it proved an eventful day. Roshin McConville. I'm glad we won the game. You can only imagine what it'd be like if we had lost, you know. But it's every time I look, you know, I just look over there, even at the 14 yard line, I just think, wow, I was I a lucky boy. McConville turns, loses it. Penalty. I, I remember, I remember the penalty. I remember thinking it wasn't the penalty. I remember, the, I remember. You still stand by it. I do. I stand by it. <laughs> I always fancy myself as being quite a penalty taker myself. All Ireland final, eighty thousand people, and you think, well, you know, I couldn't miss it today. Either. McConville strikes, saved by O'Keefe. You've got a responsibility to the rest of your teammates, and you feel as if you let everybody down. So apart from that, it was great. Like. <laughs> when Ashley missed the penalty, I, I think I died. I, I just was so far through for him. Whatever I was going to do in the second half, I was just going to go out there and work as hard as I can and just empty the tank and do whatever I could for the team. And, you know, if a chance came, then I would, I would hopefully stick at this time. So anyhow, at half time, sure, everybody was talking. I was just, just praying and talking to his father. I just said, if you're up there, you know, please, please just do it this this once. And we can need support, he's got it from Oshie McConville and the Jackson of Pace. Back again from the game, McConville. What a goal! What a goal by McConville! I see McGrain in the middle and I give it to him reluctantly. Nine players out of, out of ten would have, would have caught the ball and maybe kicked a point or caught the ball and give it back, but he didn't. He just he just palmed it down to me. And by that stage, I had my wits about me, you know, because I wanted to rectify what went on in the first half. And I just thought, like, he's going to think I'm going the far side. Like, and I just went on this side here. Like, and it was just an unbelievable moment, like, you know. And it was redemption. But funny thing. When I run out after it, all I could hear was, you know, you're expecting to hear a good goal or whatever, and all you could hear, all I could hear from certain members of the team were, we're still a point down, you get to head back in this game, and let's, let's go and let's get the winning couple of scores. Like. I'm all have it. Kim McGinney has got the ball! I'm all the All-Ireland champions! Tell me what it'll mean for your mother. Tell me what it'll mean for your family. You said to me, hold my potatoes. I'm sure she's not holding my potatoes. But, I mean, we're there and we've done it in 25 years. One goal in my life, and today I succeeded in it. You, you always prepare for um, teams' teams' strong points, and certainly Oshie McConville was one of their very strong points. Um, he, he was playing outstanding football that year, and he, he was getting crucial scores in crucial matches for them, and it, as it turned out in the final, he got that crucial goal. Now people talk about Bourne Night and you know, playing too much football. Oshin played for his club, won 12, 13 counties in a row, played every match in 12 years, and still played in all those matches with Armagh. There's very few players can, can say they've done that. It's probably immeasurable what he, what he did for Armagh over the years. To have somebody 40 yards out, to know, you know he's going to kick it over the bar. When you win a free, it's a point. Uh, that's the type of guy he was. Would Armagh have won a National League and all Ireland and seven Ulsters without Oshie McConville? I don't think so. Well, I suppose he was one of the best forwards over the last 25 years. There's no doubt about that. I mean, he gave unbelievable service to Armagh. I don't have to tell you. Marvellous footballer, great man off the ground or in the air or whatever. He was an all-round player. One of the best I've seen for a long time. I have no doubt if he was in Kerry, he'd be an automatic choice there. A lifetime goal achieved by the age of 26, leaving Crook Park back in that third Sunday in September in 2002. Life could not have been any better.
But behind the scenes, Oshie McConville's life was in turmoil. What had started as a few bets in a bookie's age just 16 had turned into an addiction. At 26, Oshie McConville was a compulsive gambler. You know, coming home on the Monday, this is where I would have found myself back on the Tuesday, like, is, is back here and, and, you know, that's where the whole spiral for me would have started again. I mean, the euphoria for me was, it only lasted, well, it lasted for quite a while, but, you know, for me, the most important thing for me was getting back in and getting back into the gambling. Like. That's where a lot of the problems come from, is to trying to replace that buzz. Losing was as big a buzz as winning was, and again, that's very hard, I'm sure, for anybody to understand, but that's the way it was for me. Right and early for the daily races. You, know, you wake up in the morning, maybe uh, leave the house at 9, 10 o'clock, you know, head for a suburb in Dublin, swords, you know, scaries, hoth, whatever, it didn't matter. Just somewhere away and where I thought nobody would know me. That would be me, I'd be planked off for a day from, from whatever time in the morning, from 11 o'clock. Sometimes, to be honest, like money used to run out within an hour and I'd have to come back down the road and tail between my legs. Sometimes I might reach 6 o'clock, sometimes I might even come home with money, you know, but the next day, like, it would just, that would all, all that money would be gone. Like, I mean, something for me was I was never going to win at that stage. Like, you know, it wasn't about winning, it was just about the thrill of putting on, putting on the bet. You know, there's a whole bravado involved in being there. Like, you think you're the big man, and you think, you know, because you're putting on more than anybody else, you're looking in your nose at them, and, you know, you know, you find all sorts of different characters in, in the bookmakers. Like, you, you, somebody could be coming off the street having spent the night on a park bench, you know, going into a bookies and trying to get a few quid for a coffee or something, maybe, to the, the hay rollers who are putting on 10 or 20 grand every race, so, you know, professional gamblers or different things got there and I would have seen myself as one of the high rollers and I would have wanted to see myself as one of the high rollers whereas in actual fact I wasn't really you know I was just I was somebody who was caught up in an addiction I was a compulsive gambler and you know I was a compulsive gambler at that stage I didn't realize it you know and I didn't want to believe it but I was and when I look back on it now I realize you know just how bad I was like and just how bad it got like, I was I was I turned myself into a loner basically you know, and it was, as I say, like, bookies was all I wanted. That was all I wanted. I wanted gambling. And that's really where I wanted to be. And I thought I was the man in those circles. Like, it soon went from an interest in racing and different things you got there to absolute obsession with just gambling. The sport didn't matter to me. Or what sport, you know, I was gambling on. You, go, you, start, you start betting on computer races and virtual racing and different things you got there. I mean... Like, see, it, like it, it does seem like complete insanity. Like I found myself, you know, sitting, you know, I had a pub in Cavan, you know, around that time, and I found myself sitting in the house, curtains drawn, like very little furniture in the house, a TV, it maybe switched on, and me maybe not even looking at it, staring through it, and it just takes everything away from you. Like you don't feel as if you're worth anything. And then trying to pick yourself up and turn up football matches, turn up the football training. Like, I was lucky at the time that I had that. You know, people say, how did you go on? How did you play the football? I was lucky. Football saved me, really, like, you know. Am I getting a chance to maybe get a second goal? It's McConville. McConville does just that. For me to have uh, money on a Gaelic football match, for me, just wouldn't have been right. And, for, and that sounds strange coming from a compulsive gambler, but it just wasn't something that I, that I, that I wanted to do. It wasn't a road that I wanted to go down. And, Luckily enough, I managed to stay clear of it because, again, it was something that was sacrosanct to me was, you know, playing football, and that was my release, and I was glad that I didn't taint it in any way. It was becoming clear to those closest to McConville that something was wrong. Oshin's brother, Jim, is a publican in the South Armagh town, just like Oshin was running a bar in Cavan. Jim knew the trade and knew his younger brother wasn't doing it right. In a couple of months after the all and I find I think it really came to a head and we, you know, we just had to sit him down and, and, and say, listen, Ashley, what's going on? Like, you've spent more time in the bookies than you are in your own pub. The first day was a very rough day, but I, I stood at the door and didn't let him out and I got his phone and started to go through the numbers and of who he owed money to. You know, we got it through it eventually, but it took maybe a month to do that. And it made painful reading. 
Oshin's addiction had left him with debts in excess of £100,000. The total spent throughout the years of gambling was in the region of half a million. It was tough because I was totally exposed. Like you know, I was, I was, I had it, I had to share everything. Like, again, as I say, I didn't share it all immediately, but after a, a while, like everything was out there on the table, and I was totally exposed to what it was. And what I felt, I was just lowest of the low at the time. This was all going on, unknown to me. They were meeting up with him and talking to him and trying to sort things out with the pub and one thing and another. And debts he had. And he said to them that he wanted to tell me himself about it. Toughest thing I've ever had to do in my life. I worried about it. I thought about it. I thought about what I was going to say. I had a lot of sleepless nights over telling my mother. So he said to me he had a problem. And I listened because I thought, well, I knew you had. I just said, well, thank God, Ashin. <laughs> Typical of my mother, whenever I told her, she just threw her hands around me and said, thank God. You know, thank God you've, you've, you've opened up and you've, you've, uh, you've told me because now you can get the proper help and all that. We could support him in other ways, financially and all that, but uh, the professional counsel and that we could not do. After finally admitting to his family and himself that he had a gambling problem, Oshin McConville needed help. And to get it, he came here, the Kunwura Rehabilitation Centre in County Galway. For the next 13 weeks, Oshin would spend time here facing the biggest battle of his life, his addiction to gambling. Mama, take this badge off of me. I can't use it anymore. When it gets in on you, like it just it rips you apart. It, it, it uh, takes everything from you. It takes your dignity from you. It takes you just beyond low. Like, it was embarrassing. It was my pride was gone. There was nothing. I, I didn't have anything at that stage. Sister, how's things? How are you keeping? Good to see you. Good to see you. Oh, Anne, how's Ocean? things? Good to see you. Alright, how are you? How do you think? How are you keeping? How are you doing? Not so bad. I suppose the first day I met Oshin, like he had lost heart and he oh, yeah. was down and he felt that he had messed everything up. And um, we explained to him in Convera that. Um, um, you know, sometimes you have to go down in order to come up. I would say that Oshin was very willing to listen. He was a good listener. Um, he was prepared to give it the time. He probably found it very difficult in the early stages of it, but he gave it the time and he didn't hurry his recovery. It was all sort of downhill at that time for me and it was... It was God knows where I would have ended up, you know? And that's not being dramatic about it, but like at that stage, anything was possible. You know, I thought about, I obviously thought, thought about suicide, you know, I thought, I, wouldn't, I never thought I'd have the guts to go through with it, you know, which is lucky for me, but certainly, you know, I didn't know where I was going to end at that stage. You know, after the four weeks of slight resistance, you know, I put my heart and soul into this. And I give this as much as I've given football or anything else beforehand. Like, and this was the most important thing to me was recovery and getting back out there and building up my self-esteem. This is where it started for me. Like, this wasn't the be all and end all, but this was giving me a major chance. Like, without here, I would never be get. Away, I've never got away from gambling. <laughs> He participated in the programme the same as everybody else. He didn't get any different treatment or indeed didn't expect it, I don't think. Um, it, again, very often people go through their own hells uh, without maybe anybody really knowing uh, what they're going through. And his work therapy, I think, was down in the, the pottery, which I think he enjoyed. Place like this, you come in, you realise, you know, you want to try different things and you're willing to try different things. And, you know, nobody fails, you know, that sort of way. You know, if you, if you try something like that, I mean, you're never going to fail. Like, you're always going to have something that you, can be, that you can be proud of. He has turned his life around, you know, and he has done it himself. 
for anybody that's out there today, you know, in a bad situation, in a desperate situation, they only need to look at somebody like Oisin, and that's possible for everybody. Is that perhaps Oisin's greatest ever achievement then? Absolutely. Was I confident going back out there? Probably a struggle for a while in that. I still was a little bit into myself. When you spend 13 weeks, you know, away from the people that you know and football and different things you got there, it's uh, it's hard to go back out there in the public domain. But it was certainly something that you know that I would have. Uh, I look forward to leaving here, but I also, you know, there was a bit of trepidation to to be honest. You know, there was a lot of. I think I'll make it. I hope I'll make it. But you never know. Leaving Galway, it was a complete change in direction for Oshin McConville. He had been helped through his darkest period by a charity. Right, let's squeeze in there. So let's... But now, charities are being helped by him. For Oshin McConville to come on board with Boher and obviously for Golf with Stars um, is huge. I mean, he, he's got you know his own, I suppose, fan base, as you can imagine. So to have a high-profile person to lend their name to our charity, and also he believes in, in what, Bo what, what Boher does. He likes the idea. I suppose it's close to his own heart. Perfect. It's always great to have uh, somebody who's known as your patron. It helps us to get to be you know, to, to get our name out there too, which is also very beneficial. And Oshin is very, um, very, very willing of his time. You know, he doesn't, he does all of this on a voluntary basis. And, you know, we really are very grateful to him. I have to admire our Irish sports stars, just like Oshin, and uh, the way they do like to give back. Uh, you know, they, they have the high profiles. And if this, is all, if this is all they do, then that's huge, because uh, they're getting the word out there. And getting the word out there really is where, where it all begins. Golfing with the stars, or starting a race for autism on the back of a trailer. All she knows he can help make a difference. Because you're sort of like in a privileged position that people know you, you know, if you can have any effect on the fact that maybe you can get another 20 people out to do a run, maybe you can get another £2,000 apart from sponsorship, well then, isn't it well worth it? I mean, you know, who knows how many children I can help? So many good causes out there. And 300 people can think it's, you know, worth, worth a while to get up this morning and go for a, a 10 mile or 13 mile walk. I mean, what's to stop me coming down here and, and sort of helping in any way I can? So that's, I suppose, what giving something back is. He's got a good heart, you know, and uh, I'm glad to see him here today, too. What you see now is the true Oshin, you know? Uh, always been a great fella, always been a good friend. So he has uh, always given his best. Uh, might not always have worked out that way, you know? But, you know, in the, the essence, the, the, I suppose the, the core essential parts of Oshin has never changed, no? When I was gambling and stuff, people would have seen me as being quite arrogant the different things he got there. A lot of it wasn't just arrogant, a lot of it was that my head wasn't in the game, like a lot of it was in my head, I wasn't fit, you know, I wasn't fit to have a conversation with people, I wasn't fit to communicate with people, and that really was, just, that was a sad thing for me, and I realised that when I was in, in Galway for 12 weeks. I will be one person, and that's something that a council will tell you never to say, but I can tell you that I will never ever gamble again, because it's not for me. Somebody who's been in Gamblers Anonymous for years will say, never say that because you never know what can happen, but it fills me with pride actually to say that. His recovery was a long and painful journey, but valuable lessons were learned. It doesn't matter if I was to go back out gambling, it didn't matter how much I was to win, it wasn't about winning because I'd lose it all and I'd lose more and I'd lose my family and I'd lose my girlfriend and I'd lose all the things that are important to me, you know? And for me, they're too important to lose. Hello. Hello. Do you want to come back? No, I don't find it. It impacts on my life at all. It affects my life at all. You know, sometimes I would say, oh, stop. I would forget myself and I'd say, stop off the shop. I, I'm going to go in there and do the law show or, you know, something like that. And he'd say, well, you know, go to the shop and do whatever you have to do, but I don't need to know that you're doing the lotto or just go in and do whatever you need to do. And I would kind of realise then that's him putting his guard up, letting you know that he doesn't, you know, he doesn't partake in that, you know. And same way as, that, you know, if you're talking and you'd say, oh, I bet you it's such a, you know, that would happen. And he'd say, well, I'd say you're right, but I'm not going to bet you on it. 
always be very conscientious and always kind of reminding himself and reminding you that, you know, he is not a betting person and, you know, I suppose he's always on his guard, but, you know, I'm, I don't think he need. well, he needs to be for himself, but he's more than okay. You know, I'd be 100% certain that Oshie would never fall no matter what happened to him in his life, you know. The Armagh superstar could always find a job, but never a career. McCumble's gambling recovery opened his eyes to a new way of life, Oshin the gambler, Oshin the counsellor. I know if I was going to a counsellor in the morning, I'd be going to someone that was living what I was going to be asking them about. And I believe that Oshin McConville lives it himself every single day. It's not dishing out advice, it's, it's listening to people. Listening to people who've never been heard before, you know, and that's the most important thing. There's people, people out there who, who I've spoke to who, who have never been listened to before. Somebody's never actually sat down and listened to them and listened to what they've gone through. And for a lot of people, when they get that off their chest, it's, it's, it becomes, life becomes a lot easier. For every person who, you know, I can help, you know, there's two people that I can't, and that's just something that you have to accept, especially when you're in the counselling game, and, you know, it's, uh, it's such a rewarding feel to be in them. You know, it's just unbelievable. I'm so proud of him. I'm really, really proud of him. I think he's helped so many people and he's done so much for himself and for his family and he's made up for everything that he's gone through, you know. If we had to help all these people and uh, bring them along in life the way he did, it's been well worth it. With life back on track off the field, will Oshie McCombell take up Paddy O'Rourke's recent offer of an inter-county comeback? I don't feel as if, you know, I'll ever get the chance to play here in an Armagh jersey now. Who knows what's around the corner, but uh, I suppose the thing that I have to look after is, is getting back and playing across and getting the fitness level up and, you know, after that, see what happens. But I um, certainly think, you know, at 34 years of age, it's highly unlikely. There's only one game that you can play here for cross, and that's Northern Ireland Club final. Is that achievable? Definitely. You know, anything's achievable with cross, and I've always said that. And I'm not saying we win an, an Armagh Championship, but we certainly be, be uh, leaving no stone unturned, and we'd be a better outfit than we were last year. The sun continues to shine on a club career, but what's the future away from football? Well, the future, you know, I'm in a relationship, and you know that's going well, and you know, hopefully someday married, you know, kids and. As I say, I always be involved in football and just generally a happy life and a, a career, hopefully in, in counselling of some sort. The cocky, confident Oshin McConville, gambling addict, just wants a wife, kids, car, simple life, involved in football. Yeah. It's quite a turnaround. It is, and, and probably a, it's all I ever wanted, but I just went a funny way about, about getting it, you know. Oshin has decided to take a more direct approach towards finding that happy life. While on holiday in Spain four days ago, he asked Irina to marry him. She said yes. <laughs>